Tonight, we are exploring monumental, those achievements, people, fuck-ups, and evolutions that have affected the world far beyond a single scale of a human or an animal. And so many of these monumental moments are commemor commemorated with monuments. I love monuments. I love all shapes and sizes of monuments. I love the beautiful ones, the ugly ones, the ones made by nature. I love it when they make me stop and go, wow. I love how they evoke emotion and how they cause controversy and start important conversations how they celebrate the heights of human achievement and swear never again to the depths of human monstrosity. They allow us to mourn for a single person or a population, whether that is for a week or until the stone wears away. I love how they have us come together to build them, and in that moment of building or years of building, we create something that is bigger and has more meaning than we originally intended. Okay, so I gotta take a pause for a minute because I was gonna talk about this beautiful plague tower in Siena and the horrifying plague that, en that ended and fueled the building of this tower, but that story is really, really dark, which we don't normally shy away from on this stage, but the fact is is that half the news articles coming into your iPhone right now are about coronavirus, and I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room has heard enough about pandemics for a while. So on Sunday night, I shifted directions. <laughs> and instead, you're gonna hear about my favorite architect of brutalist monuments, who hated monuments. So it gets dark for a minute. This is Yasolovats, a concentration camp and an execution camp that was made up of five subcamps established in 1941 by the Nazi puppet government known as the Independent State of Croatia. Not independent. As with a lot of things, most things about the Holocaust, the numbers are greatly dis disputed. But what's not disputed is the brutality of this camp. Over 100,000 men, women, and children were executed here. They were Serbs, Romanis, Jews, Croatians, Bosnian Muslims, and Slovenians. In, on April 24th, 1945, um, the remaining prisoners were executed and the camp was burnt to the ground. They knew that in only a handful of days, the partisan forces, which were the Yugoslavian anti-fascists, would arrive. And when they did, they found nothing but ashen bodies. This was a site of great sorrow for so many ethnic groups in Yugoslavia as they began to recover from World War II. And Yugoslavia was made up of many ethnic groups and many religious groups and it affected almost everyone. And it turned into basically nothing but a meadow, a meadow of sorrow, and people really wanted more. Enter this handsome fellow. This is Bogdan Bogdanovich. Ah, uh, no. Bogdan Bogdanovich. He was a partisan soldier, an anti-fascist, a philosopher, an urbanist, a surrealist, and an architect. He got hired by Yosef Tito, who has a long problematic story for another night, in, 19, in the 1950s to build monuments across the country. It was a massive movement. Uh, there are many, many monuments in former Yugoslavia. And when he was asked why he was hired, he said, I did not enjoy building these monuments. I did it because it was my duty because I saw that I could meet the challenge in an anti-monumental way, I would, be not, I would not be able to do this in any other socialist country. Tito, in all truth, did not have much uh, artistic discernment, but he understood that my monuments were not Russian monuments. At the time, unfortunately, all the best sculptors had adopted the Russian formula, headless bodies, 
wounded figures, stretchers. He saw me, a bizarre man with a surrealist biography, ready to build him constructions which were not Russian. And so he said, let him. The challenge here was to build something that respected the, the victims of the place while still being beautiful. He said, I knew that I would never look for nor find inspiration by bringing the evil back to life. Instead, he looked for termination of what he called the inherited hatred of generations to generations. He turned to the image of a flower saying, and so the basic symbol is precisely a flower. Um, the symbol of eternal renewal and after a series of variations, stylized as a flower structure with a superstructure turned two ways. Through the crypt to the victims whom it draws its roots and to the crown in a reverse dome towards the light and the sun, symbolically towards life and freedom. And so the stone flower was born on the blank site where the camp once was. And in 1966, it opened to a massive crowd. Bogdanovich continued building monuments for Yugoslavia and its people until the early 80s. In the late 80s and early 90s, Yugoslavia saw the rise of nationalism and brewing tensions between ethnic and religious groups. He had fought the fascist and was deeply disagreeable with this extreme nationalism. He was widely outspoken about that and was terrorized like many intellectuals of his time. He fled to Paris and then Vienna in 1993, where he lived in exile but continued to write and teach and make art until 2010. His monument still stands, 20 of them in fact, across the countries that used to make up Yugoslavia. I will turn to his words once more. I dream of a Europe without monuments. By that I mean without monuments of death and disaster. Perhaps philosophical construction, monuments to love and joy and jokes and laughter or symbolic constructions and everything that expresses a desire for a civilization without monuments. So I raise my glass to the man who built monuments to be anti-monumental and dreamed of a civilization without need of monuments. <laughs>